Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to today's, we'll just go with exhilarating, discussion on positive sex, or, or you know, sort of how to be sex positive. And, you know, obviously, generationally, this is going to be different. There's going to be some a thread through here, because I think there's still an, an element of shame when we talk about things. And uh, even in a different context, when I ask my students about, you know, fifth grade or seventh grade health class, you know, there's apparently they're still doing the condom over the banana thing. Who knew? So uh, this is Dr. Kimberly Quinn, and I am uh, thrilled to be here. And as you know, those of you who, who, who listen to the other episodes, uh, my whole role here is to help help people become the boss of their brain, to become the boss of their thoughts. This is truly the way to to be our best selves, live our best life, because thoughts come first and then feelings and actions, which means thoughts dictate how we feel in our, our lives, basically. So change your thoughts, change your lives. So today we're going to, you know, sort of talk about shifting into a positive sex mindset. So for me at a fabulous 56, right away, when I think of positive sex mindset, you know, where did, where did it all start? So for me, it's back in the seventies and uh, we came into this a little bit later than they do now, I think, even in the schools. And I remember, um, a little bit of a chat in fourth grade, mostly about menstruation. They separated the girls and the boys back then. I don't know if they still do that, but that was really it. And then in sixth grade, uh, poor Mr. Thompson, who was the, uh, uh, I think he was a social studies teacher, actually. Must have been, he must have drawn the uh, the short straw there. I don't know, but he got to do sex ed. And I just remember sitting there. I, I did not have any brothers. And a dad who was very uh, private and careful that way. So I had not a lot going into Mr. Thompson's sixth grade class. And uh, we took a little break from social studies, must have been. And I don't remember. If it must, maybe it was a, he maybe taught health, too. I don't remember that. But I also had him uh, when we learned about, um, you know, all the uh, Neanderthals and Paleolithic areas and all that. And now his role was as the uh, sex ed guy. I remember just sitting there when he put the slide of the penis up on, uh, on the, you know, that we had the, um, what did you call those things? Overhead projectors back then, this huge, you know, black and white penis with arrows pointing to the different parts. And I just remember sitting there, you know, probably about 12, just wanting to crack down the middle and die because we were, I was with my girl people and the boys were giggling to pieces. So were we. I just thought like, Oh my God, whatever the 12 year old version of beam me up Scotty was, that's kind of where I was at in that minute. You know, and then I, I couldn't help thinking that God or the universe, and then I was probably saying God and the creator of all things, like how did he come up with it? He must have like thrown a big, you know, like wad of Play-Doh at the wall. Let it, let gravity take over. Let it droop and said, oh, okay, then that'll be for the men. You know, and from there, that was sort of like the anatomical part of the discussion. And then, and then he got into like the female part and that just creeped me out too. Remember I'm 12 because the boys are still giggling. I'm like, I'm like, okay, this was enough when it was, you know, their parts and now it's our parts and I want to triple die. It was, it was awful. And he had a, he just had like a very endearing smile on me because I'm sure drawing the short straw couldn't have been fun for Mr. Thompson either. And then I remember uh, seventh grade, the actual health class, and it, it, it was very much about stress and a little bit of, you know, pregnancy stuff. And I just remember it being like, you know, I, I don't even, I don't actually don't even remember the condom on the banana. I don't know. Maybe that was, that predates that being, them people being that loose. I don't remember that happening. I remember my kids coming home and talking about the condom on the banana. Um, but it was very hands off, no pun intended. It was a lot of like, if you touch each other, this is what happens you know, things start to fall off. Then if it's syphilis, all that infection can go to your brain and you get crazy and die. So, you know, the, the sort of message I kind of took away from it was don't do this or there's a lot of suffering in your future and potential death. And so according to my students, it's actually not, not that different. This is pretty recent because it came up in, in my Minecraft class this summer in a more subtle way. Cause this wasn't the main focus. I think the condom and the banana thing came up and, you know, I just asked them, you know, what else is there about relationships and intimacy and respect? And, um, I, they do touch on the consent thing. I think, I hope every middle school and high school, you know, across the world touches on the consent thing. That was good news. But other than that, it wasn't like, um, 
you know, a good friend of mine talks about consent in general, in general, like if you're being asked to teach a new class or whatever, that it's not just, yeah, it's heck yeah. You know, and transferring that to sex, hopefully with two consenting adults and, um, you know, respectful, you know, uh, you know, loving relationship, hopefully it is a, a heck yeah, right? So uh, there wasn't, apparently there's not much going on with that. It's still don't touch this, don't touch that, things will fall off. You know, syphilis could go to your head and die. And now there's, of course, the the uh, AIDS virus. There's that. And, you know, and then there's the gamut of, of ways to protect yourself. There's a lot of don't do this, but if you do, you know, arm up like Fort Knox, which is important, not saying that. It just kind of saddens me that something that is so, has the potential to be so wonderfully intimate and beautiful and also a gigantic stress release and just so good for the body when when all the boxes are checked for healthy and all that. It's just unfortunate that grown-ups don't teach this to kids about sex. And I'll tell you that um, being over in France and Spain just like a month or two ago on the beach watching all this body positivity, women in bikinis, not even the whole bikini, the northern states were often exposed with uh, – and some were – thin and some were middle size and some were larger body frames and they're letting the girls breathe and they're in their little G strings and everything. And that was wonderful to see. And also, I mean, they're teenagers on the beach and everything. And it was just so normalized. And then uh, I I was over there visiting one of our daughters who've been teaching in in Madrid, which beach was this? This was Nice in Southern France. We jumped over there to see what was going on over there. And there was this couple, probably my age range, and they're on a towel, and he's in his little speedo, and probably that's very telling. So that's probably why he was kind of rolled over. And uh, you know, she—they looked amazing. They were clearly a couple very into each other, and they're kissing and just totally wrapped around each other with a packed beach. No one cares. No one's staring. Could care less. Then all of a sudden, they kind of up and left. I think the whole beach know, knew where they were headed. In about an hour, they came back, all refreshed, and jumped in the med. Well, uh, again, no big guess where they went. They went to go have, um, you know, each other and then maybe some some good uh, baguette bread, a little bit of cheese, maybe, um, you know, some nice, some nice fruit and then came back to take a dip. You know, good for them. And again, there were teenagers all over. This is all so normalized over there. And this way, I don't know. Um, I, I just think when we normalize things um, is, you know, really what they truly are, it just can it just can be that much better and definitely have conversations when we make something out to be so taboo. I'm not talking about the obvious, like the the thing, the places you just don't go little kids and things like that. We're talking about having a healthy sexual education conversation with, you know, middle school and high school kids um, who may be headed in that direction sooner rather than later. And then, you know, talking about the relationship part and the respect and the intimacy and that it's such a stress reducer, and all the benefits of healthy, very healthy consent, which includes the consensual part if it's healthy, sex. I mean, to me, if I were a high school teacher, I actually do say this to my college students when it comes up. I mean, you're supposed to touch each other. I mean, if, 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 if you choose, I'm just saying, because I have some students who, you know, just are not, and they're clear about that. Every once in a while, you have a few who just are not drawn to having sex. And obviously, that's fine. All, my only thing to say is that developmentally speaking, it is very normative for teenagers and, you know, physiologically speaking for teenagers and young adults to be touching each other. And if you opt out, totally fine. It's just all the shame that's underneath there. Never mind if you touch yourself. Oh my God. Back in the day, that was more, I would say my parents' generation, but they, they taught you, especially in Catholic school. If you fondle, 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 the, the, the Southern states, man, you were going blind. Okay. So then, you know, never mind like, you know, a further education about the anatomy too. And I remember, you know, sitting there in agony in the back of Mr. Thompson's uh, sex ed discussion and watching the penis sort of, you know, hanging there on the, on the uh, overhead projector, black and white with all the things pointing at the various parts, the urethra, the this, the that. I also remember feeling completely grossed out when he started to talk about the scrotum sac and the heat and when it gets cold, how it pulls away from the skin and it pulls close in the heat. And I couldn't help looking at that black and white penis on the board and just thinking, getting a visual 
just like yuck. And how do they stand it in the summer sticking to them? How do they walk with that thing between their legs? That's what was going through my mind at that moment. Never mind when he got to the part when he described the actual, uh, I guess, hetero experience um, with the penis and the vagina. It was that point I thought I was going to pass out because this is back in the 70s. And that's just how it goes. And this could bring up another discussion about also um, discussing, you know, the other, the other ways to have sex. Because, you know, obviously, uh, when you have, you have a room full of, a classroom full of, you know, middle schoolers or high school you've, you've scored, you've got some gay kids in there, too. And I think that that's something that should be very openly discussed. And then, obviously, since sexuality is a spectrum, I think that should be discussed, that, you know, that, um, that there's a hole in between and that it's okay to, you know, experiment here or there. And, you know, that sexuality is really, you know, about an ongoing pattern and at their respective ages, it is very, very, you know, I don't like the word normal at all. Let's just say, you know, developmentally, you know, common, appropriate, whatever, when you're kind of figuring things out to experiment. I mean, it's just so okay. It's so okay. As long as it's consensual, everybody's, you know, in it to win it like that, respectful and and loving and kind. I just, I think it should just, there should be more conversation. So rather than saying, don't touch this, don't touch that. I think we should kind of assume and not only assume, but declare we, you know, this is the state you're everybody, you teenagers touch each other. You're all touching each other in high school. You're touching each other. And then again, in college, I do say it, you're, you're touching each other. So as long as that's not only healthy and consensual, but enjoyable. So that's where we get to the, you know, really having a positive um, you know, a, a positive sex mindset is just so important. You know, and the other piece is even just anatomically, I mean, I, gosh, I was, you know, deep into adulthood before I really, you know, had the whole, I really had a more, a fuller understanding of the whole clitoris because no one teaches us this. So we got the dangly penises because that's what penises do, right? When they're at a state of rest, we'll say that. And, and then we've got all the female parts with, you know, the internal plumbing and ovaries and fallopian tubes and all that. Nowhere has anybody discussed a clitoris. And if they did, if, well, back in the 70s, they did not talk about pleasure, which is a whole nother issue because sex is so incredibly pre- ple- pleasurable. We're going to get to the benefits shortly. No one said that in the sixth grade. Why? Because they don't want you doing anything any anytime soon. Same thing in high school. Don't want to talk about how great it feels because then you go out and do it, right? So speaking of pleasure points, the clitoris is kind of thought of as this little, you know, button in the, you know, top middle between the the labia and that, you know, that's the spot. Now that spot's a good one, but you know what? The clitoris, which again, people didn't tell us, educate us on, is actually about the same size as your average penis when it rests, about 10 centimeters. And it's, it's on, it goes along the outside. Um, It's kind of, shaped like an upside down anchor, I guess you'd say. And then the rest of it kind of wraps in on the inside. And, and if you look at embryology and how, you know, the, the penis and the, and the clitoris are formed, you know, when the baby's first, like in that brine shrimp phase, a little while, a little bit past that actually, and it's not differentiated yet. It's all the same tissue. And then it, you know, turns into a penis or it turns into a clitoris. And, and that's it, but no one talks about it. And then, they don't talk about, again, the pleasure piece and the relationship relationship piece, also important. And even as far as the anatomy, this is an information solely for, in my opinion, for genetic girls, unless they start with girls, because they should know this from the ground up, you know, whenever they start the rest of the talk. It's also for a genetic boys. We say that when the parts are assigned to you are male or the parts are assigned to you are female, and anybody who identifies anywhere along there. Okay. It's, there should be knowledge. That's just for everyone because it's a human body. It's a human body and it's beautiful. The human body is beautiful. And also, um, anyone, uh, male or female or anywhere in between should also, excuse me, anyone identifying anywhere in between should also know the male parts and understand about the prostate and understand, uh, you know, later on if they, if the person has a male partner, 
that they should also that that the um, genetically male person should know what their PSA is, and that hopefully the partner is also on top of that, you know, as a as a couple later on, and um, you know, also being aware, just you know, both co- both couples aware of what's going on with each other is the, is the whole point. And a very good friend of mine, Dr. Dave Landers, taught a course at St. Mike's years ago called Men and Masculinities. And it wasn't just a course for men, but it was, a you know, or, or and it was exactly what we're talking about. Um, he had women in there, too. And the idea was to educate, you know, all, all the students on, on all of this stuff, prostates and what happens when a woman goes to the gynecologist. What are they looking for? It's like just all this stuff, and it's so important. So all this brings us back to the sex thing because it's all related. And nowhere, at least definitely not in my 70s education, and apparently recently they're not talking about it either because, again, I just asked my students about the pleasure piece. Do we talk about what a stress release sex is? It's such a huge stress release, indoor aerobics. It also is um, an anxiety reducer. Also can uh, aid in the reduction of depression. We uh, we've known forever that it lo- lowers blood pressure, which obviously leads to lower risk of heart disease, strokes, everything like that. It boosts the immune system. Um, Self esteem can go up with sex because uh, it can it can often boost confidence. It can often boost confidence. Uh, sexual desire that's one of my favorite ones because here is the thing. And like, actually, like I, I say to my husband a lot, you know, it says it's not, it's just like, you can't just eat one chocolate chip cookie, you know, it's just really hard to do or one potato chip. So when, you know, when you're having healthy, healthy, great sex, usually you want more healthy, great sex, you know, and then that continues to lower your stress, your blood pressure, boost your immune system, reduce anxiety, potentially boost, uh, reduce uh, depression too. You sleep better. And not only that, um, I think it was Rich Sands who wrote an article. I was just reading in Time Special Edition. I think it was him. Uh, that also there, it's been research has, has demonstrated that, and the greater the sex, the better this is. The very next day, the person still feels good. I mean, physiologically feels good. In addition to the confidence and all that. Never mind the intimacy because oxytocin is released, which is called the snuggle drug, right? So we feel way. Uh, we just feel so good about our partners. You know, it's the intimacy thing is just, uh, it, it's amped up with the oxytocin. Sex is also a natural pain reliever. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, what else do we have here? And that came from the women's, where did that come from? <coughs> the Center for Women's Health is, is one of them. Uh, here we go. And da, 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 sorry. Uh, increase your circulation. That's a good one. Oh, and great skin. Sex gives us great skin. So that glow, I remember, you know, in college when, you know, your roommate or whoever would come in and be like, oh, what'd you do? And we used to, we actually way back when used to call it the walk of shame, when typically a young lady would be walking across campus in the wee hours trying to kind of dodge the bullets of, of judgment, usually wearing a hockey jersey and high heels, you know, left over from the night before. And she'd have that glow, like, oh, I know what you did. And actually, the insider tells us why. It, uh, according to the insider, it says, if you've ever noticed that your skin is more glowy and radiant post-sex, you can thank the increased blood flow from your orgasm. Your skin is your body's biggest organ after all, and if you're under stress, it can show by way of a sallow, stressed-out complexion. But when you climax, blood vessels throughout the body open up, helping to stimulate collagen production and give you that flushed, look so according to Healthline. So now, I mean, I guess after listening to this podcast, you come out with glowing skin. I think people are going to know what you're doing. Um, and what else do they say? Collagen is what keeps skin looking plumped and youthful, which is why orgasms can help skin look at its best. And, uh, and let me see, as Dr. Gersh pointed out, anything and everything which improves mood and sleep and reduces stress is a benefit to skin. Who knew? Making orgasms the quickest and cheapest way to go- to gorgeous skin. Not to mention lots of fun and pleasure. All right, just saying. Okay, so then there's uh, the longevity thing. So I remember I had a, an, an article, it had to be 10 years ago at this point, that I used to share with my students. It got so tethered, I would make copies and copies 
my psychology today magazine was just falling apart after that because they all wanted copies of it <clears throat> back then. So I'm gonna have to paraphrase it. It is not in front of me, but ba the basic gist, where I forget the I forget the minimum amount of orgasms per month. But what was cool is it said on average it was about ten years longer than people not having orgasms or as many. And that was true whether that was together as a couple and or solo sex, which is good news. Now the oxytocin thing, I, the oxytocin snuggle drug thing is true that that's more active with a partner because that's, it's the snuggle drug, right? However, the endorphin release that's there no matter what, whether you're with somebody else or more than one somebody else or just yourself, that endorphin release is happening regardless. And that is also part of the whole thing. Big, big stress reduce, stress reducer. In fact, endorphins too is Greek for internal morphine. So the insider then again says, want to live longer? Have more sex. So I guess there was a four-year Welsh study, um, 918 men between the ages of 45 and 59. Oh, yay, they're my group. And found that those with high orgasmic frequency lowered their mortality risk by as much as 50%. So it's kind of along the lines of that last article I was saying. The men that had two or more orgasms a week died at a rate half of the men who had orgasms less than once a month. There you go. Proving that sexual activity seems to have a protective effect on men's health. And then there was another one. As for women, over the course of an eight-decade study on married homosexual, sorry, married heterosexual couples initially conducted by Stanford psychologist Lewis Terman in 1921, Think about how old that is, yikes. And carried out through 2011 by Howard S. Friedman, PhD, as part of the Longevity Project, researchers found a link between orgasms, health, and longevity, particularly in women who orgasmed frequently and who lived longer than their female counterparts who didn't. Okay, so I got to do a shout out to uh, Ariel Chinkle. Um, the March 2019 article, 12 Unexpected Health Benefits of Orgasms, because I want to make sure give credit where credit is due here. So I just kind of read you off two studies, and these are both, you know, uh, heterosexual studies. So that said, we know for a fact that orgasms benefit us regardless of who we are loving, obviously. The oxytocin, the snuggle drug goes off, um, and... It's just all these benefits are true are true for you, regardless of who it is you're loving, obviously. Um, I mean, just the better sleep, the whole thing. Sex drive, self-esteem, better at boosting the immune system, lower blood pressure, just the overall stress release, anxiety going down, all of it. It's so important to have a positive, positive sex mindset. Um, and then, you know... When we, when we change into a positive mindset in general, just in general, right? We go out there into the world, when, you know, and we're, you know, living, we're, 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 as they say, what do we say? Talking, walking the talk, walking the talk. And we're actually, you know, incorporating, incorporating these, these positive, positive things into our lifestyle and this new positive mindset. It's like it's contagious and it kind of leaks out of our pores. And then this contributes to the overall positivity of those around us in our relationships and, you know, the, the trickle down for that is also out into the world. You know, being a good vibe has huge bennies to the, you know, human condition in general. So, so uh, especially those those two re research studies were um, just a little older, but uh, I, I just actually wanted to sort of explore, since that obviously is narrow, I've got some stats on, oh, this is a good article, this is, What's the, what's the time of this? 2018, so it's not that long ago. Differences in orgasm frequency among gay, lesbian, bisexual, and heterosexual men and women in a U.S. national sample. So this is David Frederick, Kate John, St. John, I think, Justin Garcia, and Elizabeth Lloyd. Um, I got to tell you which. Uh, this is, uh, oh, the National Institute of Health. All right, good. National Library of Medicine. This is a good one. So I'm not going to get all, get all, give all the brainy stuff that might bore people to hear. So I'm just going to zoom right in here. So basically, this is a pretty huge sample. So if you know anything about research, that matters. So they had over about 52,500 something uh, adults in this whole sample. That's, that's very uh, solid sample. And it's no big surprise that half of those were, were uh, straight men. 
though here is the here is as far as who who is orgasming i didn't really know that was a verb yes i guess i did um okay so who who has who experiences the most orgasms okay so here it comes oops no pun intended okay heterosexual men were the most likely to say that they usually dash always orgasmed when sexually intimate okay so straight guys 95 percent of them reported having orgasms when sexually intimate the next runner-up, which okay, followed by we have gay men with 89% experiencing orgasm when intimate. And then next is bisexual men with 88% um, experiencing orgasms when intimate. Uh, next, lesbian women with 86%. Bisexual women, 60, 66% experiencing orgasm when intimate. And then last in the race here is uh, heterosexual um, women, straight women with 65%. So that's sort of, uh, again, this is a good sample size and rather current. So that's, this is just information here to know. Okay. And then, um, this is actually interesting. Uh, this is a very, a very, you know, sort of rock solid, um, you know, peer reviewed journal, ar journal article, uh, compared to women who orgasmed less frequently, women who orgasmed more frequently, were more likely to receive more oral sex, have longer duration of last sex, be more satisfied with the relationship, ask for what they want in bed, praise their partner for something they did in bed, call slash email to tease about doing something sexual, wear, wear sexy lingerie, try new sexual positions, um, anal stimulation, act out fantasies, incorporate sexy talk, and express love during sex. Just all interesting stuff here. Uh, women were more likely to orgasm if their last sexual encounter included deep kissing, manual genital stimulation, and or oral sex in addition to vaginal intercourse. And then it's so they considered um, the social, culture, and evolutionary ex explanations for some of this as well. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, So, Minecrafters, uh, this is not like a very natural place to end our discussion. It has been a wonderful one, talking about all things wonderful about uh, sex and, and shifting to a positive sex mind, mindset. Uh, also, the, the physiological and mental health benefits of orgasms. And, you know, sort of why we should all be having more of it, because it's good for us. It's so good for us. And that's really pretty much it. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.